In today's news, government inviting applications for food service grants and government extends nighttime banned on bikes. The BVI students continue to shine as well as BVI CCHA. They are calling on the government to provide a tourism industry reopening timeline. All this and so much more when 284 News returns. There's a reason you get up on a morning. A reason you pick yourself up, start the day. Maybe it's sheer grit. Maybe it's your ethics. Maybe it's because you know people like you are waiting. For people just like you. We all have our reasons. And for Republic Bank, that reason is you. Every little thing, every big thing. It's all about making a difference in your life. Because after 182 years, if it's one thing we're sure about, is that the difference is you. We're here to help. Republic Bank, we're the one for you. Welcome everybody. Good afternoon. It's Friday, June 26, 2020. I'm Ron Grant. And I am Javon Wilson. So happy, of course, to, I guess, usher them into the Absolutely, weekend. The weekend. Um, it's been a really long week well uh, for all of weekend, us. weekend, I must admit. Definitely. Yes. So we hope you're going to be doing some relaxing uh, activities this weekend. But viewers, before we head into our newscast today, I'm so excited uh, because most recently we know for sure that we've been really refreshed by our students, yes. Ron. Um, just really pushing through and their amazing ability to adapt in this time, especially going from their traditional schools mm -hmm. and transitioning to online school. Just yesterday, we spoke to Miss Liliana Foy, of course, who, were, who was able to turn her school project into yes. an actual business. And today, viewers, yet another brilliant example, uh, Mr. Azania Glasgow. He is a grade five student whose social study project uh, in the form of a song is now rocking the airways locally. I mean, everybody's sharing it. Love it, love it, love um, it. So if you haven't seen it as yet, let's just go to a short clip of his music video. Yo! As a G. As a G. Homegrown. Oh. Hey, my friends, looking for a vacation. As a Naya hair with the perfect location. It's paradise, made up of beautiful islands. It's my home, the British Virgin Islands. Yeah. The BVI made up of keys and islands. Sit back. Let me take you on a mental excursion From Annie Gala straight up to Josh Van Dyke The beauty of this place is out of sight Come to my islands Come to my islands Come to my islands Come to my islands The British Virgin Islands There's so much to do while visiting here Lots of food, fun, and sun, yeah, everywhere. All local dishes and hiking tours. Whether land or sea, there's beauty galore. galore. Jump in the water for a time of snorkeling. This you can do on a day of sailing. Hike all the way to the top of Sage Mountain. Or check out a restaurant for exquisite dining. Come to my islands. Yeah. Come to my islands. British. That was little Mr. Glasgow, of course. And what I really love about this, Ron, is his dad. Um, yes. What's his name again? That Craig. Is Craig, Craig Glasgow, Craig who's Glasgow. a gospel singer, him yes. and his wife. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about yes. this. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I think this is the second in one week we've mm -hmm. seen where parents are literally leading the which the cause and, and standing with their children and yes. supporting them in their endeavors. And I think that's the beautiful thing about this um, and, uh, celebration. And he really Coming out of Father's Day, too. Yes. 
Yes, yeah. and really acknowledging Mr. Jugo as well, mm -hmm. who we know, of course, for his Rose Sprout, the one and only amazing musical yeah. contributions. And I mean, pulling together this project in 24 hours, I just think it was a remarkable good effort. Stuff. And uh, congratulations and keep up the good work. Continuing on on the local scene, the government of the Virgin Islands is accepting applications from food service businesses in the territory of the Virgin Islands for the joint grant program with the United Nations Development Program, also known as the UNDP. Now, 10 food service businesses will receive a grant of $4,000 through the program's financial assistance to provide additional cash flow for the operational expenditure. Now, the program is also designed to provide guidance on incorporating digital services into their business modern as models as well as improving financial management practices. Premier and Minister of Finance, the Honorable Andrew A. Foy, thanked the UNDP for their continued support for the BVI during the uh, very trying times, and that is COVID-19 the crisis and encouraging businesses in this sector to apply and participate meaningfully in the program. The program is being administered by the Ministry of Finance in partnership with the Premier's Office and the Department of Trade, Investment Promotion and Consumer Affairs. Now applications are available on the government's website at bvi.gov.vg and the deadline for submission is Wednesday, July 15th. Now additional information is also being provided on the application process and businesses that are eligible to apply uh, for assistance. Now Jovan, this is a very important story because we've seen where uh, the hospitality hospitality industry, particularly our restaurants, have taken a significant hit. Even with the uh, reopening, internal reopening, we're still seeing where they're taking a, a really, um, they're having a hard time. Yes. And I think this is a, a most worthy endeavor. Um, and I think that the UNDP stepping in and showing their assistance is even a, a greater plus for the residents of the BVI. I completely agree with you, especially for the smaller restaurants, yes. Ron. Like you said, as much as we've been al allowed to reopen, uh, we've, we're still challenged in the sense that uh, COVID-19 mandates us to social distance. Yeah, uh, yeah. So they're still limited within their capacity. And also, we, if we can reflect back on when we had the lockdown and, you know, it just being a... Uh, uh, you, you weren't able to dine in, basically, yes, only yes. take out orders. Uh, and you look at the gratuity that so many persons Would depend have, on. Uh, missed out on. Yes, yes. absolutely. So um, I think this is going to really complement, especially the smaller restaurants who Indeed. really need the assistance. Viewers were moving right along. Now, despite being met with controversial reviews in several public debates, the government of the Virgin Islands has extended its ban of bikes between the hours of 5 p.m. and 5 p.m am sorry for another three weeks now the decision was reflected in government's official gazette under the road traffic restriction of use of motorcycle which stated that the updated ban will now run until july 16th while no reasoning was provided at the time the timeline of the decision uh, corresponded with a public statement uh, by Premier of the Virgin Islands, Honorable Andrew A. Foy, who said that he is duly concerned about the spike in motorbike, uh, motorcycle accidents. Premier Foy said, quote, We are seeing an increase in scooter accidents and riders are not wearing their safety gears and riding safely on the road. I am urging scooter riders to practice safety on the territory's roads, end of quote. Now, our leader also made a very passionate plea to the riders to practice safe riding, further imploring them uh, to get their scooter or motorbikes licensed, wear a helmet, and of course, abide by the road rules. Now, viewers, many residents have expressed dissatisfaction with the ban, implying that it is discriminatory. Uh, they said it works against persons who utilize a motorcycle or motorbike as their main means of transportation for personal or business uses. Now, in an effort to alleviate those concerns, special passes have since been issued uh, by DMV to security guards who work for private security companies customs and immigration officers and essential service workers other residents are urging the government and relevant authorities to enforce scooter laws as opposed to imposing curfew mm. restrictions now on a recent forum hosted by the minister of transportation works and utilities honorable kai rima one resident said quote one of the things I think we have evaded in the conversation is the responsibility of the police and the enforcement that is needed by the police. Yes, the parents have a responsibility. Yes, the government enacts the laws, but we also need law enforcement to enforce the rules, end of quote. Now, viewers, at the time, Honorable Kai Reimer actually agreed with the caller and added, quote, 
The enforcement needs to play a bigger role in terms of making the laws actually meaningful. We have the restrictions in place now, and I'm still seeing Scooter beyond uh, that time. Hmm. Is it that the law enforcers are not paying attention? Mr. Reimer further said this is a conversation that they, as in the government, will have to have with law enforcement, end of quote. Now, we also know about the noise nuisance. You know, that is another big factor highlighted by residents who support the ban. It is reported that bikers would often remove the mufflers to accommodate this, uh, even though some claims uh, it helps the bike to maneuver um, right. our terrains here in the British Virgin Islands. But nevertheless, according to the reports, this definitely has served as one of the major disturbance to many persons locally. Uh, viewers, the territory has recorded at least 50 motorbike or motorcycle related accident for 2020. So definitely a frightening reality, Ron, as Indeed. we continue to examine uh, what's going on as it relates to the conversation of bikes. I know we've been back and forth on this Indeed. for uh, a very long time. And recently, I think, uh, with the public consultations, it seems as if we were making some progress um, as uh, the minister engaged uh, members of the biking community and, you know, a lot of exchanges were made. But here we see the government still stalling a little bit uh, as they try to figure out what's the best way forward on bikes in the BBI. It is quite a, a very interesting story, Jovan, as we try to navigate the safety of uh, uh, not only uh, road users, just pedestrians, everyone that's on the road in general. And at the end of the day, uh, the statistics don't lie um, and I yes. think we have to pay attention to mm -hmm. that. Um, the Honorable Minister Kai Reimer in his statement was um, uh, very candid and very honest in saying that he, he, he seemingly wants to know exactly why is it that the laws, laws that are set are yes. being forced right. and I think that's the uh, conversation that we should be having with the uh, Commissioner of Police um, but we're going to continue more on that story but coming up still ahead Cabinet Office they are named the first COVID-19 public service heroes and a BVI CCHA calls on the government of the Virgin Islands to provide tourism industry reopening timelines a very important story as we continue all this and more after a word from our sponsors is business slow cash flow down hosting an upcoming event we can help advertise with 284 media and take your business or event to the next level by enhancing your present marketing and messaging strategies allow our team of experts to create a personalized ad that sets your business apart from all the rest this could be your business or event. So, what are you waiting for? Contact our marketing team at 284media at cctbbi.com. Advertising with us works. Viewers, welcome back. You're watching To It For News. Continuing on on a story we covered yesterday, uh, Kyla and I, the Cabinet Office has been named the first COVID-19 public service heroes following the launch of the recognition program spearheaded by the Department of Human Resources to recognize public officers who have performed exceptionally within the service in support of the Virgin Islands Public Service and the territory of the Virgin Islands during the global pandemic that is COVID-19. Now, the Cabinet Office team was nominated for their remarkable efforts, Jovan, and the extraordinary, extraordinary work they have continued to perform during these challenging times. Due to the need for urgent policy decisions, the Cabinet of the Virgin Islands met daily, which included weekends, uh, requiring the Cabinet team to work at a heightened pace for extended periods, which was far beyond their usual weekly duties. Now, additionally to that, the team was required to prepare and issue executive policy decisions taken during the meetings of the Cabinet and the National Security Council within these short periods so that the governor, the premier, and the minister of health could announce decisions to their much-anticipated COVID-19 cabinet updates. Now, Deputy Governor Mr. David Archer Jr. congratulated the cabinet secretary, the one and only uh, long-standing public servant, Ms. Yes. Sandra Ward, and her team for their outstanding and exemplary performance during such a critical and unprecedented time during which uh, the territory of the Virgin Islands uh, saw uh, very persistent and uh, consistent work by all public officers. In the statement, he said, and I quote, it gives me great pleasure to extend heartful congratulations Congratulations to Ms. Ward and members of the Cabinet Office team for their achievement as the first COVID-19 public service heroes for their commitment to providing essential services during these challenging times. Now, the Cabinet Secretary said she was delighted but more excited that her team's performance of excellence has resulted in the Cabinet Office being recognized as COVID-19 public service heroes. Now, Ms. Ward especially noted that the team also 
worked as late as 8 p.m. or sorry 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. uh, to establish and publish extraordinary issues on the official gazette to ensure the curfew orders, COVID-19 related orders, bills, and of course uh, many legislations that would have taken part and taken effect uh, throughout this period of time. Meanwhile, a deputy director uh, of the Department of Human Resources, Mrs. Michelle Donovan Stevens, described the performance as a timely one to celebrate and inspire public officers as they are instrumental in partnering and keeping this territory functioning during the novel coronavirus and of course um, the global pandemic. Now the director said that the contributions by the COVID-19 public service heroes will be posted on the various forums including the government's a website, a Facebook page, and in special public service album. Honorees will also receive a written letter of commendation. The COVID-19 Public Service Heroes program was launched by the Employee Relations Unit of the Department of Human Resources on June 2nd in recognition of public service officers and teams, ministries, departments who have went beyond and I think really, really uh, solidified their position, Jovan, yes. in making sure that the territory of the Virgin, Virgin Islands, the mm -hmm. residents are not only informed, but were kept safe from police officers, fire services, um, just just everyone, everyone i agree and i love yeah. this story because uh the successes that we've had so far around and we were able to celebrate as a territory is based on the efforts uh the efforts of all of these agree. people um, and beginning with the cabinet office like mm -hmm. you said i mean really charting the way forward as it relates to what was required because ron um, I think now more than ever, going above and beyond is so important and yeah. critical. And like, I think because we have been so successful in dealing with it, we kind of undervalue and underestimate the effort that goes into it. Of the people it. that make it possible, Yeah, that makes, makes that happen. So we want to say, uh, for, of course, congratulations. Cabinet um, office, you're doing big yes, things, guys. absolutely. And we want to say thank you as well, because we do appreciate that effort. Viewers, we have to move right along to the next story. Now, the BVI Chamber of Commerce and Hotel Association, also known as BVI CCHA, is currently engaging the government in an effort to provide a practical timeline and strategy for the reopening of the tourism industry as many business owners continue to suffer financial difficulties. Now, the move was inspired by a virtual forum that was hosted by BVI CCHA uh, that's last Monday with industry stakeholders. Uh, today, we were able to catch up with the interim chairman, Ms. Shana Smith, who was very happy to uh, share in detail, rather, the experiences and the expectations uh, from government as it relates to this issue. So, listen in. Viewers, we are joined by the interim chairman of BVI CCHA, Ms. Shana Smith. Shana, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us, Siobhan. All right, so most recently, we see uh, the BVI CCHA as a body uh, really calling and pushing on government to provide a timeline as it relates to the reopening of the tourism industry. Can you tell our viewers exactly what's within the confines of what you're asking for? Okay, so along the same line of what we've been doing in terms of being proactive in our lobbying as far as it relates to our economic recovery, what we did is we had a consultation with the tourism sector. Um, this was in collaboration with the BVI Tourist Board. Okay. And we talked to everyone from travel agents to hotel operators, the guest houses, um, the marine sector, as it relates to their readiness um, to open back up to guests. And they gave us an indication in terms of where they were. So once, again, from a government standpoint, there's a readiness to you know, manage our borders in a, a healthy and a safe way. You know what is important to us is to understand what is the timeline that the government is is looking at so that we can further prepare ourselves in terms of changing our operations you know we know we have to adapt the the, the guidelines that have already been issued and to add some additional things to make sure that persons visiting the virgin islands feel safe you know and okay. it continues to build confidence in our product so based on the sentiments echoed uh uh, of course, coming out of that meeting, you would say the industry is prepared or at least au fait with the guidelines as it relates to social distancing, how they're going to go about uh, doing business in this new phase. Would you say that they are ready? Oh, definitely. Because before this letter that we just sent this week, we had actually done some research again, regionally and globally around hospitality sector protocols. So, you know, looking at what 
the, within the region is being done um, through communications with the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association. So we have an understanding of what's happening within the, the region as well as globally. So, you know, that information has been disseminated so persons are aware in terms of, you know, how do we adapt, again, based on your business model, what needs to go into place so that there's compliance with the right. health and safety guidelines. Okay, so the government did say maybe September or later. What is the hospitality industry asking for at this point? Well, what we proposed actually was a, stu a two-stage um, timeline in terms of, you know, one scenario, which would be earlier um, than the September date that, that's been floating around as it relates to allowing um, a situation where persons can self-quarantine essentially um, at the property or whether it's, it be on the yachts or whatever their accommodations are. And then the next stage would be where you would have um, the ability to do pre-clearance as far as your health, have testing and you know, whatever other measures that the, um, the health emergency operations center would be in safe. So we are actually um, supposed to be a part of a discussion today to further talk through um, and make recommendations to further recommendations would then go to the, the cabinet. So we're part of the ongoing dialogue now um, as it relates to that. And hopefully, you know, the recommendations that have been made by the industry will be taken right. into consideration. That was the beautiful Shana Smith, the interim chairman, of course, at BVICCHA, really speaking to what those expectations are from government. Now, we all know that the tourism industry locally was heavily impacted as a result of COVID-19. Um, and we also saw it important to speak to the governor, uh, who we were honored to host yesterday right here in Studio 284 Media, and get his opinion as it relates to the reopening of our borders. And this is what he had to say. I think it's one thing for us to have our borders closed, but not knowing when it will reopen I think is breeding a lot of anxiety in the industry. Um, and like you said, a lot of persons are finding themselves, uh, businesses in financial trouble. Um, as it relates to the reopening of our borders for tourism, what do you think are the real prospects? Uh, what are we looking at as it relates to maybe some key performance indicators uh, that will say, hey, we're ready to reopen and reboot the tourism industry? Thank you. Well, it's a good question and one that uh, we are constantly addressing and thinking through at Cabinet. And as you know, we've opened the borders in a, in a limited way. And some of the conditions around that were, are we able to, to safely bring people back in? Have we got quarantine facilities? Are we able to, to ensure that they're either in a home and secure, or there's a government uh, quarantine facility? And that's allowed us to bring, or to open up, or bring in belongings and residents back. But I'm very, very conscious, and we're all very conscious at Cabinet about the, the difficulties and the hardships uh, the, the borders being shut uh, more widely mean, particularly for those who, whose lives are here. Um, many, many on work permit hol holders who have been here many, many years, and uh, we want to get them, them back as soon as we can. And that, those are active discussions that are going on. It's also, there's work, which is for the Minister of Tourism more to talk about, but work that's going on about the protocols for how do we um, ensure that we can open up in a, in a safe way. One of the things, though, that we've also done is during this period have built up our health system more. And I'm hugely grateful for the support from the United Kingdom on this. We've had um, about 250,000 items of kit, of medical equipment, come from the United Kingdom. Everything from testing machines, so we can now test on island within 45 minutes. And these are rapid, they're called Gene Expert, a rapid testing machine. We've uh, got more test kits. So built, we've had um, more ventilators. We hope we never need to use them, but we've had more medical equipment should we be there. So building up our health system and our capabilities to test, assess, um, whilst then we put in place the protocols and the arrangements to ensure people can come back safely. But it is an area that I hope we can say, as a government, can say more about soon. That was His Excellency Augustus Jasper, of course, who spoke eloquently to what we need to be looking for as, as it relates to some of the key performance indicators. But one thing we know, Ron, is that uh, we in the region, especially the BVI, yes. have been able to celebrate relatively low uh, coronavirus uh, statistics as it relates to and in comparison to the rest of the world and larger countries. But we also have to be reminded of that course. we also live in a region that is... Uh, tourism dependent, yes. uh, the, the economies are, are dependent on 
the tourism industry. So we really have to begin to look at ways where we can reopen, of course, in a safe, managed approach. But it's very clear, based on the impact we've seen so far, especially in the hospitality industry, that we cannot continue to keep the borders closed for a very long time. I appreciate that, and I, I am fully well understanding of the fact that we are uh, very uh, reliant on a yes. lot of uh, overseas and yes. international assistance and, and business transactions. Um, I think, again, one of the things that we have to consider is really uh, pushing for the ability for persons to skillfully um, live through um, and maneuver yes. through COVID-19, uh, not behaving as though it's something that we could just avoid altogether, mm -hmm. but really, really solidifying our ability to uh, perform our duties and yes. to carry on our business as uh, regular citizens Adopt. with being safe, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that we all have to uh, kind of get a, 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 a gist of and understand and really push for. All right, Veers, Veers, a lot more news still ahead, yes. so stick with us. Initiate sequence. Penetrate this man's soul with my heart. What? Watch and learn. Sir? Hello, viewers. Welcome back to 284 News. Now, as we wind down, great news for the fisheries industry. The government of the Virgin Islands has partnered with the UK government for sustainable fisheries management right here in the Virgin Islands with the launch of a $390,000 project. Now, the UK government's funded uh, Darwin Initiative has announced the projects funded under this year's Darwin's Plus scheme, which provides grants to projects working on environmental issues in the UK overseas territories. Now, one of the successful projects in the latest funding round is a joint project being delivered by the UK Center for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science, uh, CFAS, the Government of the Virgin Islands and the Caribbean National Natural Sorry Resources Institute, also known as CANARI. Now, Minister for Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture, Dr. The Honorable Natalia Whitley said, quote, this project will assist us uh, to better manage our fisheries resources, which are an important part of the Virgin Islands culture and economy. We are happy uh, about this partnership with CIFAS and Canary and the technical expertise these agencies bring to our shores. He added, an important part of this project is the work that will take place with fishers to assist them in organizing themselves and understanding their role in sustainable fisheries. We are thankful for the opportunity afforded through the UK uh, government's Darwin Initiative and of course look forward to the implementation of the project over the next three years. Now, viewers, this three-year project will review and consolidate existing evidence, data, and maps for the marine area and produce a centralized fisheries database as well as a fisheries evidence report to improve the, and capture and display the fisheries data as well as support future licensing and management decisions. It will also strengthen fisher full capacity and engagement and facilitate the development of a formalized network of fisher folk to enable a collective voice and greater participation in the decision making. Now, in addition to that, capability will uh, be built, of course, with the government of the Virgin Islands to support the ongoing management of the evidence base. Now, CIFA's chief scientist, Professor Mr. Stuart Rogers said, quote, we are delighted to be working with the government of the Virgin Islands and fishery stakeholders in the Virgin Islands to build on the progress already made on sustainable fisheries management. We understand the importance of evidence to support and, uh, of course, to support good decision making. And we are looking forward to working in partnership 
with the managers and uh, the community as well. Now, the project will build capacity in fisheries evidence, networks, and management to support ongoing sustainable fisheries management. Now, Ron, uh, we've been over this many times yes. uh, over fisheries and agriculture and industry uh, of the past and the, the premier sitting in the House of Assembly today. It seems that we're going back to many of the industries of the past that will sustain us uh, in this current time. So I'm happy to see uh, the supportive framework and mm -hmm. financial assistance that is going to be coming through this partnership? I think it is warranted and absolutely um, uh, essential. Uh, at the end of the day, one of the things that we have, I think, in all honesty, strayed from as an economy or as a territory, rather, is um, the whole grassroots um, yes. and, and, and taking care of ourselves. Yes. So I'm happy to see uh, with the administration and Ministry of Education, uh, Dr. The Honorable and Natalia Wheatley there. We're bringing some of that into uh, fruition. What I would like to see the government of the Virgin Islands address, however, is the um, ability for us to go uh, to a central location yes. uh, and, and purchase our fish uh, fisheries yes. uh, since the hurricanes of 2017 mm -hmm. have been down. Um, and I know a lot of persons, and we still get our fish, uh, nevertheless, we yes. still get our fish uh, from different communities, place. but a centralized place, yes. or even to s just see it be recreated yes. and, and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. done differently. Um, mm -hmm. From Carrot Bay to uh, Beef Island, um, we get our fish, but we want to see and persons uh, would like to be able to have the opportunity to purchase their fish and seafood in a central location. So we're, we're rooting for uh, the fisheries and agriculture. And of course, the interview you did with the Honorable Minister and yes. it pertains to the, the well um, talked about topic of uh, marijuana. marijuana and the decriminalization, the legalization. I think of it's course. something that our residents are definitely looking forward to. All right, viewers, we are out of time. I, um, yeah. Thank you so yes. much for joining us. I think that's the most we can say at this point. Thank <laughs> you so much. Enjoy the weekend. Relax Happy a little Friday, bit. Happy Friday, guys. Um, uh, and, of course, join us again on Monday. My name is Javon Wilson. And I'm Ron Grant. Have a fabulous weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. Well, not Monday, Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Territory Day when we see yes. you. Yes.